and let us pray. Indeed, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. For your presence is what we all long for. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill this place with your glory. And Lord, as always, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart always be found acceptable in your sight, my Lord and my Redeemer. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Amen. Today I share this message with you against the 2019 General Conference backdrop of what will be a watershed moment in our lives together as United Methodists, and in particular as a denomination. And I know that many of you come with ancient spirits. I know that many of you come with deep frustration. I know that some of you come with deep anger and disappointment and frustration at leadership. But there's one thing I hope we've come this week to do. And that is, I hope that we have come to collectively pray together the words of the hymn writer when he says, guide us, O thy great Jehovah. Pilgrims through this barren land, we are weak, but you are strong. Guide us and hold us with your powerful hand. Open now the crystal fountain, which the healing stream doth flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar Lead us all our journey long, strong deliverer. Be thou still our strength and our shield. And I come today with the words of Thomas Merton on my heart. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. And I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, and nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you, and I hope, and I hope that all that I have that desire in all that I'm doing, I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though, it may seem, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me and you will never leave me to face peril alone. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the midst of all that would divide us, in the midst of all the chaos and all the darkness and all the anxiety, I refuse to stand before you as one in despair. But I stand before you in the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, for I understand this one thing, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. For we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And so I simply stand in the truth of a basic promise that was spoken by the risen Christ, God's anointed, the Lord of lords, the kings of kings, 
when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will send you another advocate to be with you forever. And this is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know, because he abides in you. And I will not leave you orphaned. And Jesus goes on to make the promise clearer when he says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But one day, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you, my peace. So I don't come in despair because Jesus made a promise, my peace, I leave with you. I give to you not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so today, in a spirit of Pentecost, I do not despair about the church because I believe in the promise of Jesus Christ. And so today I choose to look and lead through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin this annual conference, we invite each one of you to invite the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and your heart so that we might indeed see the possibilities, and live the promise. I invite you to prayerfully ponder with me two events in the liturgical life of the church, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ and Pentecost. Ponder. Pray with me, church. Pray that this great Pentecost promise of Jesus Christ will make his presence felt among us in this room, in this very minute, at this very time. Ponder and pray with me, church. Pray with me that God would do it again, right now, right here, that after all is said and done and all the blogs have been written, and all the ink has been spilled. Pray with me, church. And say, come, Lord Jesus, and do it again. Pour out your spirit on your people so that our sons and our daughters shall prophesy and our old men shall dream dreams. And our young men and women shall see visions. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Lord, send your holy fire. Send your holy wind. Send your Holy Spirit down like a dove and let it dance. Let it dance. Let it dance, Lord, from heart to heart and mind to mind and soul to soul. Let us lay everything else down and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Whatever you've come with in your heart, let it go. And say, Lord, fill that space with your Holy Spirit. Feel that anxiety with your Holy Spirit. Feel that doubt and that fear. Feel it, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And as we pray, and as we pray for the Spirit to come, I invite you to lead through the eyes of the ascension of our Lord. And oh, what a marvelous event that must have been. I could only imagine. It must have been one of those jaw-dropping, knee-quivering moments as the disciples stood there together watching the risen Lord be ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And I don't know about you, but I suspect that I would have been right there with them, gazing 
into heaven. My eyes would have been wide open wondering where is Jesus going now and what are we going to do? I often wonder what were the disciples thinking as they watched Jesus being caught up. What did they think would happen when this mysterious promise power of the Holy Spirit would fall upon them? What did they feel when Jesus came in the room that day where they were locked behind closed doors and he simply said, peace, peace be with you. And when he understood that they were at peace, listen to what he says. He says, as the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. And with that, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. What were they thinking? As Jesus was being lifted up into heaven, yes, I would have been right there with him, gazing into heaven, hoping that Jesus would take me with him, that hoping that the kingdom was coming. And so, friends, I can't blame the disciples for asking the question, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? For who among us in this very room have not asked that question, how long, O oh God? And in my spirit, I could hear the refrain, not long. How long, O oh God, before you restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus was leaving. What would happen now? What would happen to all this talk about the kingdom of God when he would say the kingdom of God is like? What would happen? What about all those miracles? Were they just magic tricks? Would salvation and redemption and, and reconciliation still be a possibility? What would happen to all the hope he had given to the hopeless? The least, the lost, the last, the marginalized, the oppressed. The disciples must have thought, how can we carry out this work? The world is a dangerous place, and people are not ready to follow the teachings about love and justice and mercy and peace from a wandering preacher from Nazareth who went and got himself nailed to a cross much less that he walked out of the grave three days, and they tell me that all of this, all of this was done to bring about the redemption of all of creation, to set us free from the bondage of sin, to reconcile us to God and to one another, in short, to heal the world to heal the universe. Where well, the angels gave these gates and disciples some good advice that I think would be that we would do well to follow ourselves. The angels asked these confused disciples, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? For this same Jesus who has been caught up into heaven will come again in the same way you saw him go. And friends, until Jesus returns, we are called to be witnesses to the good news of the gospel. And we can't be true witnesses with our heads stuck up in the clouds gazing into heaven. No, my brothers and sisters. Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven. There are men and women and children going to bed hungry tonight. Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven. For our young people are searching for a church that, that, ha that, has, that, has circled, that has not circled the wagons and living in our faith in a protective and a survival mode, they are searching for a living faith, and now is not the time. 
Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven. We have a charge to keep. We have a God to glorify. We have a story to tell to the nations. Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven when it's not even safe for our children to get an education in our schools because they're always worried about when the next school shooting will happen. Now is not the time. Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven. For there are men and women and children being abused every day, both physically and mentally. Now is not the time to be gazing into heaven when oppression still has women and men and children and people living on the margins locked in its evil mm -hmm. tentacles. Now, Kentucky, now is not the time to be gazing into heaven. There's work to be done. There are souls to be saved. There are doors to be opened. There are ways to be made. Again, there is a charge to keep a God to glorify. If we dare let it come out of our mouths that he is our Lord and our Savior and our King, then it's time for us, and excuse my French, to get up off our butts and start sharing the good news of the gospel. <laughs> now is not the time. I had a friend of mine in North Carolina who said he stopped recess in kindergarten. And it's time, Kentucky, for us to stop playing around with this thing. Well, Bishop, that all sounds very inspirational, and it, and it sounds so good, and, and you say it so eloquently and, and so poetically. But I'm with the disciples. How are we supposed to do this? It often appears that Jesus left his work in some very shaky hands. Now, y'all got to let me take my time and fix this up. I got to get it right. But Jesus left his work in some very shaky hands. But remember that Jesus has made us a promise inviting us to look and lead through the eyes of the Spirit because this same Jesus will not only return, but I believe that he is with us even now to empower and to encourage and to equip us so that we might see the possibilities and, and that we might live the promise. Jesus has never asked us to do anything that he would not give us the power and the grace to do it with over and over again. I remind myself that his grace will be sufficient for all that I will ever need. Over and over again, I remind myself that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Every once in a while, I have to remind myself that I am more than a conqueror through him that loved us so. Every once in a while, I have to remind myself that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, Kentucky. Now is not the time. Now is not the time. And listen to the way he says the promise again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And friends, this is not an option. This is not multiple choice. He says you will. Somebody help me. You will be my witnesses. And if we're witnesses, if we say we believe in them, get our heads out of the clouds and stop gazing into heaven. Now is not the time. Pastor Jim Nichols, a member of our, of our worship team, gave me a wonderful liturgical resource. And when I opened it, I found these words. And these words almost moved me to tears. 
words from Matthew Skinner, and I quote, Pentecost is an invitation to dream. Let that marinate for a minute. Pentecost is an invitation to dream. For when a community of faith quits dreaming dreams, it has little to offer either its members or to the wider world. And these dreams involved adopting a new perspective on what's possible, rousing our creativity to free us from conventional expectation. I believe I better say that again. To free us from conventional expectations. You see, in Jesus' day, it was conventional wisdom to say an eye for an eye, two for two. But Jesus says, I say to you, I say to you, Pentecost is an invitation to dream. They help us see that maybe what we thought was outlandish actually is within reach. Friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, when the spirit of Pentecost falls, all things become possible if we choose and find the courage to not quench the spirit. Don't be scared. Or how do the young people used to say it? Don't be scared. That's the way. Don't, don't be scared. We cannot keep a power like this bottled up under our control, and maybe that's the problem. We have forgotten that this extraordinary power does not come from us, but it comes from God. I don't care what seminary you graduated from. The power comes from God. I don't care what office you hold in the Kentucky United Methodist Church or the annual conference. I don't care what office you hold. The extraordinary power belongs to God and not for us. And the sooner we give it back to him, the sooner we understand that the church has never been ours. It's always belonged to God. As soon as we let it go, my little daughter Ava always sings, the song from Frozen, Let It Go. <laughs> and my daughter Liz, when I first asked Ava, I said, Ava, what's your favorite song? And she said, Anna Elsa. My daughter say, you in trouble now. She's going to sing, Let It Go until you leave this house. <laughs> and then they messed around and got a karaoke mic that sang, Let It Go. And when she's singing, the spirit is in her, and she's jumping around and bouncing around saying, let it go. Well, Kentucky, we got to let some things go. We've got to lay our weapons down and say, now, Lord, you have your way. I'm almost through. I'm about to get it right. Y'all just let me take my time. <laughs> y'all messed up when y'all asked the bishop to preach the opening service. Brother Kevin, we're going to get to an executive session sometime. <laughs> sometime today we're going to make it. But we can't keep a, po a power like this bottled up in our control. Listen to Jesus earlier in this promise. He says to the disciples, I want you to go and stay. And I want you to wait in the city for the promised Holy Spirit. But friends, this was not a passive waiting I could almost hear them praying. Can you hear them praying in that upper room? And I believe somebody in this building today is praying. Can I could sense them. I could almost see them worshiping. And we're in this place. We are worshiping God. I could almost see it and feel it in my spirit. I could feel it even though it comes from across the ages. I, I can feel them praying and striving to have everything on one accord, to have everything in common, to be in the unity of the spirit. I could almost feel it in my heart. It was not a passive waiting. And so could it be that Jesus is inviting us to that same active waiting, actively living into acts of justice and, and love and mercy and peace and hope and reconciliation? What if, what if Jesus, what if his return was not only imminent, but that he is actually present 
and active in the world. What if Jesus is present in the faces of every man, woman, and child? Turn around and look at your neighbor and say, could it be that Jesus is in those eyes? Just go on. You can look at each other. I know you don't like to stand, but look at each other. And ask yourself, could it be that Jesus is shining in those eyes? Could it be that he's present among us even now? What if we look and lead in every situation with the Holy Spirit? What if we led by the Holy Spirit? What would happen to our fears? What would happen to our anxieties? What would happen to our doubts? What would change about how we live with each other if we were leading by the power of the Holy Spirit? You cannot be touched by Jesus Christ and stay the same. It just ain't happening. Now, if it has not transformed you, then maybe you need to go back and, and, and go to the altar and ask for seconds or something. Because it's impossible to be touched by the Spirit of God and get up from the altar and leave the same way. It's impossible to come to the communion table where Jesus says, makes this invitation, come all to this table. Y'all, I, I feel good. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm quit apologizing. But see, I know what it's like not to be welcome at some tables. Oh, I know what's that like. But oh, the Holy Spirit, every time the preacher stands behind this table, I hear my name. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what side of the tracks you come from. There's room at this table. And only the Holy Spirit can make that kind of room at this table. And so, friends, Holy Spirit, you are indeed welcome here. Now, one last legend that I have to tell you about. For every time I think about Pentecost, I think about this legend that I once read. There's a legend that states that after the ascension, when Jesus returned to heaven as the exalted and reigning Christ, some of the angels decided that they would get together and that they would question Jesus about his accomplishments while he was on earth. And they asked Jesus, while you on earth, did you found a great movement? Did you lead a great army? How many followers did you have? To which Jesus answered, I, I generally attracted good crowds, but I only had 12 disciples and a few friends and a group of dedicated women who supported the ministry. And well, the angel said that they were so few, they must have been exceptional human beings with outstanding character, persons who were leaders in their community, to which Jesus answered, actually, they were rather ordinary folk, tax collector, several fishermen, just everyday common working folk. Then evidently, they must have been a very loyal group. And the angel replied in Jesus' answer, I believe they wanted to be loyal. I believe they wanted to stay with me. I believe they wanted to believe that I was the son of the living God. But in my hour of crisis, when I needed a friend most, one betrayed me. And another denied me, and almost all of them fled. And yet you expect this group to carry on your work, they asked. Yes, I do, Jesus said. Surely, surely you must have some other plan, the angel said. No, no, Jesus said, I have no other plan. But you must have another group somewhere in case this one fails, the angel said. To which Jesus answered, I have no other group. This group is the only one I'm depending on because this group will be my church. As unstable and as unreliable as we are, as easily as we become discouraged or distracted, 
as quickly as we become tired and ready to give up, as often as we are inclined to complain and engage in self-pity, as stubborn as we are and as insistent in walking in our own willful way, as weak and as unworthy as we are, the fact remains that Jesus has committed and entrusted the ongoing work of the kingdom into our hands. Again, the New Testament makes it clear that our Lord left his work in some shaky hands. To the very end, Peter continued to leap before he looked and to speak before he thought, but you don't have nobody in Kentucky like that. To the very end, Judas maintained a secret agenda. Now, I know that, that nobody's come to annual conference with a secret agenda. Thomas openly doubted, and James and John were always fighting over who were going to be the greatest when the kingdom of God came. And yet, these were the ones who had been entrusted with the task of proclaiming salvation. The movement that Jesus left was a confused and frightened and lifeless movement. Yes, they had been weak, but Jesus had made them a promise. Jesus had made them a promise of the coming Holy Spirit. And so this was a group that was waiting on its power. Kentucky, are you waiting on your power? Nobody answered. Are you waiting on your power, Kentucky? Yes, you, you can talk back to me. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a black preacher. I like folk to talk back to me. <laughs> they were waiting on their power for they understood that a spirit was coming that would change everything. A spirit that was coming would change how they live. A spirit was coming that would give them holy boldness. A spirit was coming that would turn the world upside down with all that had happened to their little group, with all their disappointment and confusion and weakness, Jesus made them a promise. And if we are to discover, and if we are to develop, and if we are to send passionate spiritual disciples and resources to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, we've got to be plugged into the power cells ourselves. We cannot give what we don't have. We've got to be plugged into the power source. Many of you have heard me tell this story about my daughter Liz, my first appointment was a three-point charge, and, and I was making minimum salary, and it was $13,800 at the time. And, and I'm there with a, with a three-year-old and a three-month-old daughter, and the first thing the church asked me, would you take a cut? <laughs> but making $13,800, I couldn't afford to send my clothes to the cleaners. I could do that now, you know. And I used to have to iron my clothes, so I set the ironing board up one morning, and I was trying to rush to get to the church, and I was trying to iron it, and my daughter Liz was standing there laughing at me. And I said, Liz, why are you laughing at your daddy? And she said, Daddy, if you think you're going to iron that shirt, you crazy. <laughs> she said, the iron ain't even plugged up. <laughs> And so, Kentucky, let's plug into the power source. Let us say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are what we've longed for. You are what we're waiting on, church, if we just let the Holy Spirit have its way. Think about what God can do. And so, Kentucky, let's get plugged in to the power source. Let's lay it all down and do the work of the kingdom. God bless you, and may God keep you. And may this space, as Chuck told us, as you walk in this place, may you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do it. We're going to mess around, and the Holy Spirit is going to get hold of us, some of us. <laughs> and some of us going to jump up out our seat, even though we ain't got no rhythm, but the Holy Spirit going to get us. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit going to get us. 
and we ain't going to be able to do nothing but raise our hand. Now, I'm not trying to make you out of Pentecostal Holiness Conference, but every once in a while, you got to let the Spirit get in your feet. Every once in a while, you let it, let it get, get in your heart. Every once in a while, it's got to get all over you. Every once in a while, it's got to make you cry, and you don't even know what you're crying about. Every once in a while, it's got to make you want to wave your hand. Every once in a while, it's got to make you say amen. Every once in a while, it'll make you say that, that for Christ I'll live and for Christ I'll die. For every once in a while, church, it'll put a song in your heart. For every once in a while, it'll make you say that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Every once in a while, the joy will get in your feet. Every once in a while, it'll get in your heart. Come on, Kentucky, and say, come, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. Raise your hand right now and say, come, Holy Spirit. Go on, you can say it. Come, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. You are what our hearts long for. And we can't preach, and we can't sing, and we can't legislate, and we can't do nothing else until your Spirit comes. And so come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. I'm done. Now let me quit. Y'all going to make me want to preach some more. Let me quit. Come on to the table. Come on. <laughs>